And now we have uh, Christopher Martin, who's going to tell us the links between the flow of baryons and the CGM. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, I want you to imagine a time in decades from now when we can make a map uh, of all the baryons in the universe, not just galaxies. No offense to galaxies. But the baryons in the intergalactic medium, the cosmic web, and the circumgalactic medium probably tell an amazingly important story about the evolution and history of galaxies. And uh, we have a program at Caltech with many other collaborators to try to begin this process. So I, I'll tell you about that today, and in particular results from the Keck Cosmic Web Imager. Uh, <laughs> I see this as a long-term program. Uh, in order to use Lyman Alpha, which is the brightest line, emission line, uh, and that map was a Lyman Alpha map, uh, we first need to understand it, and in particular understand radiative transfer. Uh, then we can use it, and we're starting to use it to understand the flow of baryons in the circumgalactic medium and to try to relate those flows to the evolutionary state and history of galaxies. Ultimately, we will link them with the uh, distributed cosmic web uh, and begin to make maps that ultimately could be used for cosmological uh, investigations. Uh, in particular, I want to focus on uh, work that's going on for a decade. Uh, saying that uh, perhaps the reason that there's an epoch of star formation is that the uh, cold accretion flows are fueling uh, 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 sustained periods of star formation, linking directly the, the cosmic web to star-forming galaxies, and that these uh, cold flows can produce uh, large extended structures, rotating structures, uh, filamentary connections, uh, as they spiral in uh, to uh, occupy the galaxy and, and form stars. Uh, so, methods. Uh, we, we like to use uh, integral field imaging spectroscopy, uh, and, uh, and that's becoming uh, one of the uh, very important tools for galaxy evolution as well, uh, as, as, as many speakers have, have shown. Uh, and then, uh, because we're going very faint, we need to do precision sky subtraction, uh, and we use non-shuffle in, in the faintest cases. And then, uh, for the uh, low redshift universe, the, Explore Lyman Alpha and the other UV resonance lines, we need high efficiency detectors. So we have a program to develop detectors that 10 times the uh, efficiency of Galax and still photon count and have low noise. Uh, but I think uh, one of the issues th that I think is starting to be addressed at this conference is trying to relate uh, simulations <coughs> with uh, observations like 3D emission line cubes. I think there's a gap. Uh, and uh, we want to use the simulations, simulations like the fire simulation, uh, to try to relate that to this is a challenge, uh, uh, if you think about it. And you can make predictions, uh, but you have to select regions and objects. Uh, and then you want to use the prediction, for, presumably, to validate or overturn the theories that these predictions are based on, determine physical parameters, and so on. How do we do that? Uh, in particular, 3D emission line cubes uh, have this interesting property. If you look at multi-object spectroscopy, uh, you can calculate the number of degrees of freedom, and you get something like 1,000 to 100th power. It's a small number, uh, because individual objects are galaxies, and they can be parameterized by a small number of parameters. Uh, whereas, if you look at 3D spectroscopic data cubes, an individual uh, voxel uh, can maybe have a 100 dynamic range, and you might have 200,000 voxels, so you have this many degrees of freedom. So uh, we, we have a more unbounded problem. Uh, and uh, I want to propose, and I think this is starting to happen, that ultimately what we want, the simulators to provide us with a grid of cosmological models. Uh, you know, uh, it'll take larger computers, maybe quantum computers to do it, in which all these things are varying. Uh, and then we have, for example, 3D emission line data cubes. Uh, and then forward modeling, this has been talked about today, uh, to produce simulated uh, emission line data cubes. And then uh, what I'm going to talk about today in particular is bridge modeling, which is to connect these two toy models I'll talk about today, physical models, and of course machine learning has been discussed. So I think uh, that's, a, that's a, a growth area for comparing simulations and, and, and this kind of data. 
Okay, as far as our instrumental or our experimental program, uh, we explore everywhere, everything from <laughs> the epoch of reionization uh, with the red, oops, sorry, the red channel of the uh, um, uh, case of EOI, which is under construction. The blue channel is commissioned. Uh, and then uh, we have a balloon to do redshift set 0.7 Lyman alpha. Ultimately, we hope that's an explorer, uh, uh, which will cover the uh, uh, redshift 0 to uh, 1.5 range of Lyman alpha. Okay, so to explore the low redshift universe and to pioneer the technology, uh, uh, we have an instrument called Fireball. We hope to fly it this September. It's, a, it's the first wide field multi object UV imaging spectrometer. Uh, it's designed to do 50 uh, objects per field of Lyman alpha emitting galaxies at redshift 0.7, found by ground based surveys. It, and it has many features to test uh, new technology and it does a lot of training as well. All this science and technology is Pathfinder for uh, MIDEX, for UV probes, uh, LUBAR, et cetera. Uh, and just a few words about it. Uh, it's a large collaboration, Caltech, JPL, uh, Marseille, CNES, Columbia University. Uh, one meter uh, uh, mirror, siderostat, a paraboloid, and a spectrograph detector. It's all cooled CCD, photon counting CCD. Uh, a mass set, uh, eight mass uh, for science mass, plus slits and calibration mass. It shows about 50 galaxies per mask. Uh, we hope to observe four fields in a night. And the flight lasts only one night. Uh, the photon counting CCD, this shows a calibration arc lamp showing uh, the uh, objects uh, with emission lines being detected. And the efficiency of the CCD is about 50% in the balloon window. Okay, now I want to turn to uh, uh, the, the focus of my talk, which is uh, uh, data from the KCWI. And this is based on the prototype of KCWI, the Palomar Cosmograph Imager, uh, and one of our central results was the discovery of a ro large rotating disk-like structure uh, illuminated by a nearby quasar, which uh, uh, suggested, which, which looked like the kind of things that cold accretion models predict, large uh, structures uh, with a lot of angular momentum uh, and accretion, cold accretion from the cosmic web. Basically, the model is it's a, it's a disk-like structure, there's a filament, and it's illuminated by a quasar. So all of these uh, objects I'll be showing you in a few minutes uh, are like that. Here are four of those that were discovered by a PCWI, and you can infer some parameters. Large masses, they're all redshift 2 to 2.5 to 3. Uh, and I, I can, <laughs> uh, in the interest of time, I'll go straight to the KCWI results. We're also doing a survey with PCWI, PCWI in order to find quasars with emission. And basically, all the, uh, this has also been found by Muse, all quasars uh, show emission around them. So, uh, uh, now, turning to case of the UI, it was commissioned last, uh, last spring, uh, and uh, it has, uh, it's, occupies a different sort of uh, uh, parameter space than Muse in the sense that it's focused on being a very flexible, versatile instrument to uh, provide uh, support for a wide range of science cases, ranging from uh, this uh, Z equals zero object, uh, exoplanet analog, to uh, uh, Lyman alpha halos and high redshift galaxies. Uh, and it does this with multiple slicers, multiple gratings, resolutions ranging from 1,000 to 20,000. Uh, excellent blue coverage and ultimately excellent red coverage out to basically 11,000 angstroms. Redshift of eight uh, Lyman alpha. Um, oops, there's the group that uh, responsible for it. There's a comparison to uh, use uh, with the ultimately with the red channel incorporated. Uh, we're working on it. We're working on it. It's a struggle. Muse produces excellent data. This is the one of the commissioning first light observations, just showing that we're getting a resolution of 20,000 in a, a globular cluster. Uh, and uh, this shows uh, this is actually relevant to this conference. Uh, this is M M51. We're mapping uh, O3. You can see O3 is in the uh, uh, red line versus H beta. Uh, and there's a red wing, a high-velocity wing. And if you look at just the high-velocity uh, emission from O3, 
it occupies the same zones as the UV bright zones, the galaxy traced UV bright zones, uh, where, the, where the feedback has cleared away the gas and dust. Uh, so this is quite interesting, showing that feedback is directly uh, impacting the ISM in galaxies. Uh, very different kind of observation. Uh, very faint uh, <coughs> uh, ultra diffuse galaxy. We're actually measuring a radial uh, velocity dispersion curve, uh, ultimately constraining stellar pops abundance as kinematics and the nature of dark matter. Okay, uh, so we have started looking at uh, PCWI uh, quasar illuminated uh, rotating structures. Are they really disks? Is there any evidence for? actual radial sp uh, in spiral flow. Uh, the basic issue is it's not going to really be a disk. It's going to be an inflow. There's, there's a filament flowing in. It's going to spiral in through some process uh, and, uh, and ultimately form the galaxy at the center. Uh, but it looks like a very complicated thing. How do we recognize this and model it uh, in our data? Uh, well, we have just submitted a paper saying how we're going to do that or how we have done it, uh, and hopefully it'll be accepted soon. Uh, so uh, this is a simulated galaxy called Vela, from the Vela simulation, Vela 07. This is what it would, a case of the eye would see in emission, in velocity, and in dispersion. And I'm going to focus on the velocity maps now. And we're going to uh, combine rotation. This is rotation in the face-on plane. This is rotation in an edge-on view. Uh, velocity map. Uh, wh what do we do with this radial inflow? Well, it's not as immutably constant. It's also linearly varying roughly with radius. Uh, it's smaller inside than it is outside. Uh, and uh, so what do we do? Well, we make it azimuthally modulated. Uh, we put in basically a sine uh, decomposition uh, with one cycle plus two cycles plus three cycles, depending on how many parameters we want to add. This shows one with three, three total uh, modes. Uh, and the basic idea is there's inflow. Everything blue is inflow. Uh, everything red is outflow. Uh, but it's azimuthally varying. And it has a, it's, it's not periodic, of course. It has some weird structure. But this can be uh, decomposed in, in a, it's basically the Fourier series in azimuth. Uh, okay, so and then when you put these radio flows in and put in the inclination, you get interesting azimuthal modulations in the velocity map that gets added to the disk rotation. How well does this work? Well, we're adding more and more parameters, so we have to be careful. Uh, yes, chi square will go down. Uh, <laughs> so uh, this is what we get with a simple rotation. So instead of using chi square, we use uh, the uh, uh, chi k uh, information criterion, which penalizes chi squared for the number of parameters. Okay, so if the AIC goes down, that means the next model, the more complex model, is is a better model. Okay, so this is adding a non-azimuthally modulated linear radial flow. So you get more complicated velocity profiles twisted, uh, and the, and the IC goes down. But add this uh, zonal modulation, one mode, and it goes down very significantly. Uh, and then continuing to add more, you can make that a spiral. You can add a second mode, a third mode, and you can modulate the azimuthal velocity as well. Uh, and basically, uh, the best uh, you get a good result just adding the first uh, azimuthally modulated mode. OK. And then you can reconstruct the object in the face-on plane. Uh, and uh, that's the emission, or it's column density. That's the radial flow, just the radial flow. So you see what you're, you're, you're measuring is radial flow along this filament coming in. Uh, and the, the central galaxy is right there. Uh, and there's some images showing that. So uh, it seems to be working. OK, let's apply it to some data. Uh, this is an object uh, Q109 uh, or CSO38. Uh, that's the object, and there's a Lyman alpha blob near it. Uh, that's the PCBI observation, KCBI in one hour. Um, uh, intensity, velocity, dispersion. 
and a blow up around the object itself, intensity, velocity, and dispersion. Okay, we're going to apply this same trick. Uh, start with simple rotation. That's the data. That's the model. Uh, AIC. So I'm going to add radial, radial variation, no azimuthal variation. Now one mode. Look at that. It goes down from 340 almost to 200. Um, and what you see is instead of having a simple gradient in the velocity, the spider diagram, you have gradient going in an ortho orthogonal direction. Uh, that's an indicator of this radial component. And then we can add more modes. It, it, it gets maybe slightly better. Uh, but one mode does a pretty good job. Um, okay. Uh, what does that say? Well, there's, uh, here's the column density. Here's the radial velocity. There's inflow on this side. This happens to be this direction. Um, so, and there's a an, there's an star forming galaxy at the center, uh, 10 solar masses per a year, uh, and the, uh, sorry, it's more like 20, and the mean mass flow inflow, uh, inflow rate calculated from the, from the MFI model is about 20 to 40 solar masses per year. So there's a direct connection between the inflowing gas and the star formation rate at the center. It's, a, it's very close to each other. Uh, OK, uh, this is an object that was discovered here at Santa Cruz, Sebastiano Cantalupo and, and Xavier Prochaska. Uh, we observed it immediately as soon as we got a grading that would observe it <laughs> with PCWI. And, and that resulted in a nature paper. Now this is the uh, case of your observation, four hours, the emission. Uh, the PCWI velocity map, the KCWI, sorry, velocity map. Uh, it's a bit better. It's actually, I looked at it and I said, what is going on here? <laughs> How are we going to fit this? It looks much more complicated. It's too much information. Uh, we should have st stuck with a simpler observation. Uh, anyway, so that's, that's what we've got to fit. Uh, let's see if we can do it. Uh, simple rotation, AIC. Uh, 600. Uh, model 2, linear radial, no azimuth. Now we add one mode. Uh, it's better, but it's not that great. Two modes, uh, and then three modes. And all of a sudden, the IC is down a factor of two. Um, interesting, OK? Seems to work. I never thought I could reproduce this uh, with a simple model, but, it, but that, there's a simple model. And again, you can see where the radio flow is occurring, the inflow, and it corresponds, this is the face on reconstruction, it corresponds to the filament uh, showing where the, the, the flow is coming in. So it looks pretty promising. And the, oh, and the mass inflow rate, again, it's comparable to what we think the star formation rate is for this object, uh, we haven't measured a directly a redshift yet, but, but that's what we estimated. Okay, so we have, and then we have a couple more. This is actually PCBI observation, the data, um, the, uh, <coughs> the di simple disk model, and the MFI model. Always significantly better fit. Okay, uh, I have. One minute. Uh, this is a completely different kind of object. This is a, uh, a quasar. The quasar is actually there. It's been subtracted. There's this giant thing around it. Uh, it actually uh, looks like two interacting disks, um, large, large gas disk. There are tidal features. Uh, this is a barn simulation. This happened to look exactly like it. I, I don't know if that means anything. Uh, but the key thing is there's rotation. You can look at the channel map, sorry, and there's rotation in both the upper and the lower. One of the disks seems to be uh, centered on the quasar, and the other seems to be offset from it. Uh, and both are rotating. And both are rotating in roughly the same direction, within uh, 90 degrees. And if you use the same technique, you can actually show that there's, again, absolutely modulated radial inflows along the axis toward the quasar. Um, suggesting that you can use it for other applications as well. Okay. 
Uh, we're building the red channel. It's perfectly suited to cover the region where ionization is going uh, over, uh, over a large dynamic range from redshift 6 to redshift 8. 2021, and we would like to do uh, a UV version of KCWI, uh, so we're calling it XCWI for Explorer CWI, uh, and uh, stay tuned in case you're on the review panel or on the science team. Either one is possible. Okay, so that's the summary. Thank you. Some questions? Yeah, thank you. Um, I obviously find this extremely exciting, um, but one question that I had, you mentioned the Sebastiano Cantalupo observations of the Slug Nebula. One of the points that they first made there, and it's been made repeatedly by the Muse group, uh, who've been observing similar things, is that they see, they, they infer a lot of very dense substructure uh, that they can't resolve in, in what they claim are the filaments. Do you see similar things, or can you comment on whether you uh, think you might be seeing them? That's based on uh, their ionization model. Yeah. And uh, I think if it's in a disk, it's not, with reasonable modest clumping factors, it's not, it's not an issue. It's illuminated by a nearby quasar. Uh, it's, it's completely ionized, so it's all recombination. Uh, and you can, because of that, it's very simple to model. You can infer the column density, and the column densities are what the modelers predict for these. So it's, uh, it, if it's a filament of the cosmic web, it's a problem. But if it's a forming disk or whatever we're going to call them, cold flow in spiral, it's not so much a problem. Because it's already settled down into a dense system, a denser system. Any other questions? Chris, can I ask about the model that you have? Does it assume that any given line of sight is, has only one component? Yes. It, it does, right? So yes. in principle, though, the velocity dispersion could tell you that there's actually <coughs> two flows yes. going each direction. Do you take advantage of that in, under Not your current yet. modeling? But you could. You could. Yes. Yeah. So well, in you principle, you can model the entire that. cube right. with, a, with, a, with a full three-dimensional. Right. Yes. Because yes. conceptually, it seems like velocity dispersion yeah. should give you some that's the next breaking. moment. That's right. the next moment. And you right. go to higher moments. Right. Uh, yes, right. absolutely. But you just don't have it now, but you can do it in yeah. the future. Good, good, good. <laughs> One step at a time. OK, thanks. Can you tell the difference between inflow and outflow? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so that is something that I think about in 3 AM in the middle of the night. <laughs> and uh, what I have, first of all, First of all, the models work, and there is there are some areas where there's flow, which is it's not really outflow, but it's it's flow away from the center of the system. Uh, but you're talking about winds, basically, um, probably. So if you do a simple calculation, and I didn't realize this until I did the calculation, <laughs> um, winds will the emission measure from winds turns out to be very small uh, because they're going out. It's 1 over r squared. It's n squared l. And the n squared goes down very precipitously because it's going down. Each n is going down precipitously. Uh, it, so, so you see, you're going to see outflows. That object I showed you that Don Herb did, that's an outflow, I think. Uh, because the emission source is in the center, and the Lyman alpha is diffusing out. And then it's an optical depth problem. But for r radiative recombination, uh, it's completely different parameter space. So in some sense, when you have a quasar illuminated system, it's mostly going to show you the inflows. So that's what I believe. OK, let's thank uh, all our speakers for this session. And now we have a discussion.